Go. Today's date is December 9th, 2013. We're recording this interview for the Freedom Area Historical Society today at the home of Tom and Jean Greenwood. Tom and Jean, on behalf of the Historical Society and the untold individuals who will view this interview, we want to thank you for your willingness to share your life's journey and family knowledge with us today. There is no doubt that as time passes, this record will be an increasingly valuable snapshot in time, enjoyed not only by your family, but also by untold generations to come. We'll get started by asking you to say and spell your names, please. Jean, let me see, Murphy Coffee Greenwood. And spell them, J-E-A-N-N-E-M-U-R-P-H-Y-C-O-F-F-E-Y-G-R-E-E-N-W-O-O-D. Uh, oh, my name is Thomas J. Greenwood, T-H-O-M-A-S, J for Joseph, and Greenwood is G-R-E-E-N-W-O-O-D. D. Thank you. Gene, we'll start with you. And we're going to turn on the Wayback Machine here. So we're going to try to keep this thing in some kind of chronological order, oldest to newest, so to speak. So if you, if you tell us what you know about your great-grandparents, first of all, William and Anna Mooney Coffee. I know very little about that, except that I know that the Moonies were all from Kakana and that area, not really from the Freedom area. And when I was little, I remember going and visiting with my mother and Grandma and Grandpa to the Moonies over there, and that is about the extent to, that I know that family. Okay. So then, going onward, how about stories about your grandparents, John W. and Margaret Vandehe Coffee? What about them? Okay, John Coffey, uh, I know more about that from the cemetery than uh, the, the brothers of John Coffey and where they came from in Ireland and they did not come from County Cork, as a lot of people say. And the reason so many people that are Irish say they came from County Cork is that's where the boat left from when their ancestors came to the United States. They left from Cork. That's where the boats left. But they actually, the one is, the one that's in northern, almost to the north in Ireland, is where they came from, the coffees. And the, the, on our first trip to Ireland when we went over, it was quite amusing. We got off the plane and started to leave the airport and we saw all this air coffee construction company, big signs all over, which made us smile anyway. Uh, but the coffees we found, we went up there. What was the name of that county again? Westmeath. Westmeath. That's where they actually came from, Westmeath. And I keep forgetting that. My forgetfulness is more <laughs> apparent as I age. Now this was John W. came from there? No, no, John this is, W. This is William and, and Anna came from there. That came, William that was their parents and his brother, some of his brothers, I think they were born there. Okay. Because some of them in the cemetery said, say Westmeath on them. Okay. But now John W., your grandfather, he was born here? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And how about your grandmother, you said? The, the Moonies, you said, this is your great-grandmother, were from Kokona. How about your your grandmother, Margaret Vandehei? Well, she came from near Hollandtown. Hollandtown, all the Vandeheys, there are tons of them out in Hollandtown, Wrightstown, and at Father Vandehei. They're all related, all those Vandeheis. Mrs. Um, Mrs. Venable, that's why they were cousins of my dad's, because their mother was a Vandehei. No, Curtin. 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 Grandma, Grandma Coffee's. My, was a curtain. Curtin Vandehei were that family, oh, okay. and that's why they were 
cousins. They came, their mother was a curtain, and grandma's mother was a curtain. So somehow, those Van de Heys, but there are tons of them. If you ever get a chance to read Father Van de Heys' book, there's a lot about the Van de Heys family in there and the history of them. Interesting. Okay, so now we're going to jump. You got some stories about your grandma, John W., and grandpa and grandma? Uh, yes, I have. To. <laughs> I got stories about Grandpa hmm. Van de Heij. Grandma Van de Heij, Grandma Coffee, was a very, very organized person. She kind of called the shots. And John Van de Heij, John Coffee, uh, the coffee is, my dad was tall and thin. Grandpa Coffee was very thin, but he wasn't real tall. Uh, if you remember Art Coffee, he was he was small like Art, and uh, but he had everything organized over there on the farm, and Grandma ran the ship. Ran the ship. <laughs> <laughs> did you go to the farm quite a bit as yes. a young girl? I did a lot because I was practicing. My brother is eleven years younger than I am, so I went over there. Probably when my parents had to go somewhere, I went over and I stayed by Grandma because. I was the only one, and it was just, I liked it there, so they left me there. And then would pick me up the next day morning or whatever. And so I did. I even rode the, <laughs> I rode the dog. <laughs> and um, my cousin Johnny Mike used to love to come from Milwaukee and stay there. He rode the cows when he used to bring the cows in from the pasture. Where they'd send us to get the cows, and Johnny would ride the cows. Grandma didn't like that, but he did. <laughs> yeah, oh, so, but we went there a lot because that farm, the home farm on Highway 55, then when, after Grandpa Coffee died, my dad bought that farm. So we always had a, um, like a farm manager ran it. Daddy wasn't exactly there. But, so then we were back and forth to the farm and they let me ride the drive the tractor, which I liked, and uh, all those kind of things. In fact, I got, I don't know if I should mention this, but I got my first driver's license when I was 14 years old because Daddy sent the cop down from the store and came to the front door and rapped, and I answered it, and he said, are you Jeannie? And I said, yep. And he said, your dad said you need a driver's license. I said, okay. And so I filled out a little sheet of paper he said, do you have a quarter? I said, I'll find one. Went and got a quarter. And he said, okay, now you have a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> it was an unusual way to get it, but I took advantage of it. <laughs> anyway. Oh. Okay. Did you have to get another license then later on? No, no, that was my license. I just had it renewed. I had that license from the time I was 14. And when you said the farm on 55, where was the farm located? Well, it's about two miles on the left-hand side of the road towards Seymour on Highway 55, where Willard Dowell was there after when Daddy sold the farm. They sold it to Willard Dowell. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. that was Grace's in-laws. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... We'll come forward a little bit further here and okay. talk about your mom and dad, Herman and Marie. Mm -hmm. I mean, you couldn't hardly say Herman without saying Marie. When we would go to the store, as an example, it was Herman mm -hmm. and Marie's store. It wasn't just Herman's store. But anyway, your dad was quite an individual, and uh, so was your mom. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, share with us what you'd like about your growing up, first of all, and then, uh, you know, Let's get up to the time of, uh, of perhaps the store. Let's, let's go before this, he purchased the store. Okay, before my dad started the store, Daddy was very active in Murphy construction. He had trucks, um, stone trucks or whatever they were, gravel trucks. And he also ran the crusher when they were out on road jobs like up in Michigan, and they had the crew went up there and stayed up there. And um, they had 
like they call them trailers today, they call them camp wagons then, but that's exactly what they were, what people call trailers today. And they all lived in Make a Circle, and they would, uh, Highway 2 up in Michigan, that big highway, that was all done in the time when I was a little girl, because I went along, I was only a little girl. And I went along with all of them and sat in the middle, I've been told, sat in the middle of the card table while they played cards. <laughs> But anyway, that was, an in, that was an interesting time. Well, anyway, so Daddy was very involved with that. And even after, then he became allergic to oil or something. He couldn't, and gasoline. He couldn't work with what he had been done. So that's when he came back and he had gravel trucks that other people went. And then he started with store business, that kind of stuff. So when they went into the store, that was, I was about 12. Now, this was with a reading in the pursuit, it said Rob Murphy Construction, but I think that was Ed Murphy, wasn't it? That was Ed Murphy, yes. you are correct. Mm -hmm. It was Ed Murphy Construction. He was the one that uh, built the roads to the north, up in Michigan, northern mm -hmm. Wisconsin. That's where they did almost all of that. Your father also yes. was there, Gene was there, Absolutely. and Patty yeah. Branderson. Mm -hmm. and Patty Randerson was the one that took away my tutor. I wouldn't give it up for anybody, but he asked me for it, so I gave it to him. And that was always the story. He was the only one that got my tutor away from me. <laughs> so, and I remember Jean and Pat then. They kind of always ate with us. Okay. Yeah. I don't know why, why that happened, but that's what happened. Neither one was married then. But. When they went out on, they, my mother always called it road jobs, and so they would take all the trailers. It was like a, a group would go, all the trucks would pull the trailers and they'd go up north and then they'd make like a round thing you used to see in the movies, and they'd make a big circle and put a porch in between them all, and that's the way they lived all the time they built these roads. And there was like Marvin Murphy and Alice there. And that's how Jack Schomer happened to be along. I, why, I don't know, but it was Alice's brother. He just came along. That's what people did. <laughs> and Joe Murphy was just married. To, uh, uh, and Jimmy Murphy, he came along. He's not much younger than I am. And he came, he was a little baby up there. I remember that. I also remember Alice Murphy chasing the dog down the road when he stole the meat from the porch while it was thawing out. <laughs> but she got it. And anyway, um, it was just one big family. And like the Randersons, there was Jean Randerson and Pat, Patty Randerson. They kind of ate with us. They weren't married yet. They were younger at that time. And uh, I, I just remember all these people all being in this little circle. And, that's what that was life. Yeah. That was it. You know, you think about it. That was really quite an undertaking by Ed Murphy. I yes. Mean, to, he must have had quite a company at that particular time. Yes, he did. And uh, his sons were involved at that time, and Joe and uh, Joe and Marvin. But there were like your family, uh, Randersons were there. Jean and Patrick, and Harold Smith was another one that was there always. He was, he operated the, um, what do you call that, the crane? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Harold Smith. Life, and she was from near Pulaski. I can't remember her name, but I remember her brothers had a band. Because if they were playing in the area, everybody had to go to the band. So, and I'd go along because I was a little girl and they didn't have any place to put me and they'd have to, this is kind of interesting, but I've been told this. They always had to take my potty chair along because I wouldn't go in the bathrooms. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if you want that on there. Oh, that's, that's good. <laughs> but anyway, but that was Rosalie, and what was her last name, Tom? That uh, I, 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 I don't remember I don't her remember name, it. but it was I'll she was call you up tomorrow. Name. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, I just had a so. But anyway, we, that was an interesting life. But my mother said that Daddy had to not be going anymore because Jeannie had to go to school now. <laughs> so that was about the time when I was about six years old that they, they stopped that and he came back here. 
and <laughs> mother, uh, the house that's on Main Street in Freedom there, the big white house, that actually was where Grandma and Grandpa Murphy lived. <clears throat> my mother lived there too. My mother was the youngest of the Murphy family, and there were 12 children. And two of the children died, like with pneumonia or something, when they were when they were little. But 10 survived, and my mother was the baby. So when they moved from the land down outside of Freedom to Freedom, mother was still with them. My mother and dad, my dad was 32, I think, when he was married. That's probably another thing. He was married in, no, what was it? They were married in 29, so he was 28 years old. I was born in 32. <laughs> anyway, now you know. When you say the big white house, is that the one across from our coffee's business? From the insurance there. That's the big white house. And that, um, Grandma and Grandpa Murphy and my mother, and then when my dad, th their wedding took place in Freedom at St. Nicholas, and then they had the reception right there. I've got pictures of that in the backyard. That's where the wedding reception was at that house, and that's all that. And then Grandma and Grandpa lived there. We lived there, and then in 19, the morning of the, my first communion, then Grandma Murphy died. And uh, then mother and dad, I don't know, probably bought the house, I don't know. Anyway, and then Grandpa Murphy lived with us until 1945 when he died. But the Murphy, where they came from, right now, <clears throat> you go out of Freedom, you know where the Colonial is? You go about a mile, mile or two further, where was, you probably remember where Joe Murphy lived. Joe Murphy's farm, that was the original farm there, where Joe Murphy and Marvin Murphy were. That was the original farm. But Grandpa Murphy owned all the land from where that started. Do you know where Earl Smith's farm was? Right by yes. Audenhovens, that's where Oneida starts, the mm -hmm. reservation. From there, from that point, Grandpa Murphy had that land all the way, and it was on both sides of the road, and it went on the other side down to the creek. And on that side, it went back probably a mile or so, oh. the, wow. the whole way. Now, this was Curly Pat. Yeah, there, there was right. first. Yeah, there was Grandpa yeah. Murphy's farm, and then Ed Murphy, and then Curly Murphy. Then yeah. when it must have been as they got married, they got a farm. I'm not sure. Okay. And uh, Curly Murphy, and then you went down there. There was a school, mm -hmm. Johnny Burns School, and then it came to Maggie Murphy married Pat Garvey. And then they had a big piece of land there. And then the next farm was Ella Murphy married Earl Smith. So all those farms were all in the Murphys for many years. Most of the land is still owned by the Murphys, some of them, somehow, some way, and other relatives. And I, I think as you go a little bit further on down, then you get just about to Vance Valley. Yes. And that's where Rob Murphy Yes. Had the farm on the uh, uh, on the west side. Yeah, Rob Murphy. They so, bought that from from um, I knew at one time it's somewhere um, where Rob Murphy started that farm. Rob Murphy was one of the younger ones. He was next to my mother. My mother was the baby, and no, and then Archie, and then Rob, and then he started there, and that's where he started the pits, okay. I'm, the gravel pits. And he had a big pit there, and that's how Rob Murphy got into the business, and then in Black Creek and all over that, all the pits. And then he became in the road building business. Wow. That's quite a... Now, your mother and Ed were brother and sister. Yes. Ed, the construction person. Yeah. And, yeah. and Rob was her brother, too. Yeah. They, they were all the Murphys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they had, they were in the road business. Still are. <laughs> Interesting story. Wow. So what about aunts and uncles on your dad's side, like Leo and John and some of those? Any uh, stories about those? The coffees uh, followed a different pattern. The coffees became mostly businessmen and professional people. They either had businesses 
or John was the funeral, had John Coffee Funeral Home in De Pere, and then came, Syl was a doc doctor, Sylvester became a doctor, Francis became a doctor, me and Lillian, two of the girls, they went down to school and they became medical technicians, and <clears throat> Leo had Coffee Motors, Art went in the insurance business, I'm trying to think, who am I missing? Oh, of course, Herman, your dad. Oh, my dad, yeah. yeah. Well, he, he became the store. He was in the road and in the store. And I'm missing somebody. Aunt May. Oh, Aunt May, yeah, Aunt May. Uncle May. Alex. Yeah, well, he yeah. was a cheesemaker. Yeah, I was a cheesemaker. And May became, she was always a nurse's assistant. Okay. And um, I think I got them all. But that's the coffees. They kind of all went off to school or to business like that. Um, that's how Daddy, I guess, ended up. <laughs> he had the farm. Art was the one that always used to say, Herman was the one we all had a hit for a little bit of cash if we had to go back to school. <laughs> he was the one that would tuck the $10 bill in your pocket and said, be careful. <laughs> Now you mentioned that your dad, going back to the farm time now, that he had uh, a manager on the farm? Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. That uh, I remember one of Bo Garrett's daughter's husband, she and her husband, they were on the farm. And I can't remember his name. I can see, I can see him, I can picture him, but I can't remember his name. He was there for quite a while. Um, it was one of his daughters. <laughs> I can't remember his name. I remember him coming to the store yeah. in Freedom and buying stuff, but I, I, I don't... I can't remember his name, isn't that awful? Yeah. So your dad had yet another job, an outside job. Was he with the stone trucks at this time? No, uh, no, not when he started the store. The stone trucks were all gone. Okay. They, they, that probably ended about, well, had him till probably about 1945, okay, 44, 45. All right, I guess. Um, so your dad had the, the coffee farm, mm -hmm. and um, did he do other store things before he purchased? He, now, he purchased a store that I know of, the general yeah. store from Johnny Schomer, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Did he, was he in the store business prior to that? Yeah, he worked for Joe Geenan too while okay. he was doing, I don't know, he worked for Joe Geenan in the store before he bought, uh, mm -hmm. opened the store. And Joe Geenan's wife was daddy's sister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they were uh, brothers and sisters and cousins. <laughs> well, that, that's where you forgot Clara. Oh, that's what I yeah. forgot. Clara. Yeah. Clara, that's the one I forgot. Clara was married to Joe Keenan, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what Clara did. <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, and Daddy then, of course, then he was, well, we lived almost on top of the store. He was over there, too. I don't know. He was always, he was always doing something. He was running the farm and with stone trucks and working at the store and, Okay, now now you, your dad buys the store from Johnny Schomer. Yep. Okay, and I can remember this. Mm -hmm. um, did had... you live, now there was a little apartment above the store, as my memory serves me. Did you ever live at the store? or? Tom and I lived at the store, above the store, after we were first married. Okay. And we were there, and then we had um, Johnny. And then we had Jimmy, and then they decided that we should have a house, so we built the house. And then okay. we... 1954. 1954. We were married in 51, and we built the house in 54. Okay. <coughs> now we're going to go back a little bit here. Okay. We got this Tom Greenwood guy in the yeah, picture now. Yeah, he came now. in. Tell me uh, about how you and Tom Greenwood ended up meeting, and a little bit about your courtship and that kind of thing. We met. We met. <laughs> if she makes any mistakes, I I will tell you about them. Okay, <laughs> not too much. And anyway, um, I went away to school when I was <clears throat> 13 years old to St. Mary Springs because, well, that goes back into the Murphys too. 
Grandpa Murphy's sister was a nun, and she was an Agnesian nun down in Fond du Lac, and she was one of the founders that started St. Mary Springs High School down in Fond du Lac. And so, of course, my mother insisted that I had to go to school there. So I went to school. It was a boarding school for girls, and then it had day students, boys and girls that came from Fond du Lac, that went in from Fond du Lac. So I went down there to school, and <clears throat> while I was there, we, I went home <clears throat> for a weekend with a friend, and uh, I got home, and she went with a boy that went to St. Norbert, and he had a guy home with him for the weekend, too. And his name was Tom Greenwood. And so he had two boys, Tom Greenwood and Pat Moore. And <clears throat> so Dolores had another friend. She said, okay, she said, we're going to all go out to the movie tonight. She said, and you can double date. And I said, one's Tom Greenwood and one's Pat Moore. And I said, I'll take Greenwood. I said, I, at least I know the name at the time. I had no idea he lived in Kukana. <laughs> but I found out quickly. And so that's when how I met Tom Greenwood, and uh, I guess I kept him after I took him. Well, Tom, tell us a little bit now. Were you going to St. Norbert's at the time? I I I went to a boarding school also, which was St. Norbert High School. It was on the that's campus of St. Norbert College, and uh, we only could uh, go home. That was a long trip, you know, all the way from Kona, 15 miles to De Pere. <laughs> so I stayed there, and we went home once a month. We could go home. Jeannie went home from the St. Mary Springs uh, every weekend, but we had to stay there. So when we our weekends came, we uh, we would take another guy along, one of the other guys who didn't want to go home, and so on. So this Pat Moore was a uh, uh, a boy from uh, Brussels, Wisconsin. His dad was a, a tavern keeper and a beer distributor. But anyway, uh, Pat came home with me, and and then we got set up on this thing with. <laughs> with okay, so with, now, how far along in school were you guys when when you met? So about uh, junior. I think it was. It junior was like high about school. April or May of our junior year. We were just about finished. It was about 1945. No, not 45. 50. 40, 49. 49. Yeah. 49. 49. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. So you see each other not as very, often as you can. Then? Not very often. At okay. first, he was down there, and he had to stay there, and so. Of course, I had a driver's license. You remember oh, that yes. from the story. Yeah. <laughs> so I could drive down there and pick him up, and. We could go out, and then I'd drop them back off at the school again, kind of, the well, way it went. <laughs> well, of course, when I was a senior in, uh, in high school, there was a young whippersnapper from, from Freedom was starting to go to St. Norbert uh, High School. His name was Joseph Bud Geenan. Okay. And yeah, uh, yeah. so if there was a weekend or something or something going on, of course, Buddy had a car, as young as he was. He would say, "Well, why don't you uh, come to uh, come to my house?" You know. So he would talk to the priest there, and say, "Well, oh well, sure, Tom can go go with you. that would be all right." And then I'd end up in freedom. <laughs> so there was a little instigation there between between Buddy and uh, yes. kept us knowing each other. So what did they? What did you do on a date? Oh, not much. <laughs> well, you go to the dance. You go to the Nightingale, or or go to a movie. Uh, that's about all there was to do. Yeah, there was really wasn't anything more than that. Yeah. Are there were beer bars. No, we couldn't go to uh, beer bars. We I, weren't open. I well, was I was eighteen. Up. I wasn't. Though. And of course, I would never go if I wasn't. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> so now I see in this, in the Freedom um, Historical mm -hmm. Society book, mm -hmm. that uh, one of your, your 49 Ford convertible was in this homecoming parade. Mm -hmm. at now, now, this 49 Ford convertible, is that something you had 
during your courting days? No? Mm. Okay. We no. bought that after we were married. That was Uncle Francis, uh, his wife's uh, Ford convertible, and Francis was getting a new one for Jean. And so Uncle Leo was selling the Fords in Kakana. So Uncle Leo said, would you like a new car? And we said, which one? And he said, Aunt Jean's convertible. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, it was two years old. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember uh, it didn't have turning lights. It's 1949. This was 1951. We were married on 2-3. We bought the car on 3-2 of 1951. It's just a month later. But uh, that was a real nice car. It had an overdrive. Mm -hmm. It had fender skirts. It had a radio. Wow. Very nice car. And then we had to sell it because we had John and Jim and Jim always got earrings well, with the two, hair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it did last until 1954. Then we bought a car that had a hard top. <laughs> And it didn't rattle. Those convertibles were just, you'd drive over a bump and the, all the, the convertible top parts would rattle. Oh, yeah. Then we actually had some money to buy a car. <laughs> or getting some anyway, or working at it anyway. $1,250 for that car. <laughs> wow. Well, my, my, my best friend, when I lived, was a little girl, and I had a friend two doors away was B.D. Gertz. That's where Arnold Gertz, Arnold Levin, he had the, the garage in Freedom. And uh, so B.D. and I, B.D. had four brothers, and I had no one at that time, so B.D. and I were like glue. And everything we did, we did together. You know, you didn't move. She taught me how to do all kinds of things, and her brothers were really mean. But anyway, <laughs> we, we grew up together, and we were always together. As we grew up, and we lived in the big white house, I had very short thing to get to church and to school. And we had a very difficult time getting there because we had two boys that were in our class. Vernon Leash lived across the street next to the priest tower, and right next door to me was Vernon Garvey. And they were very good at slingshots and BB guns and snowballs and all kinds of things. So Beatty and I would watch. And if we thought they already went to school, we'd run like heck to get there. Or otherwise, if we saw them outside, we didn't move. But we had a, it was like a bad road to get over there to school. <laughs> so we had a, a system. They would come to school. And they didn't like to go to church, but we'd go to church early. They wouldn't show up that early, so we, that's how we solved that situation. <laughs> and uh, they were, we had quite a time at grade school. We had some very busy boys in our class besides Vernon Leash and Vernon Garvey and Tommy Gertz and Mike Evan. <laughs> Pick all the guys in town <laughs> that <laughs> were good at things. And, they would bring, another thing they did was so, they would bring a mouse to school. And they, we had all the nuns at that time. They'd bring the mouse in and all of a sudden, oh my goodness, there goes a mouse around the floor and all the girls are screaming and everything else. And then they'd catch the mouse and they'd have to take it out to the burn barrel. Of course, it never hit the burn barrel. It went back in somebody's pocket and they brought it back again in a week or two. <laughs> but it was quite interesting, St. Nicholas School. And the thing is, I started very young because I, when the kids would go out for recess at St. Nick's, I'd go over and play with them. Because I liked that. I'd go over and play with them. And nobody stopped me. I went right back into school with them. <laughs> I would go in and then finally the nun would say, Jean, you have to go home now. <laughs> you aren't in school yet. But I would go just walk into school and I'd stay until they made me go home. So this is like when you're three, four, five years yeah. old prior to six yeah. years old being in the first grade. Now. Yeah, that was prior to being in the first grade. <laughs> so that anyway, I went to St. Nicholas and I enjoyed it very much. Charlene was our teacher in the fifth grade. 
she was she was the music person and played the organ when we sang in the choir and everything and she was really really nice and I kept in contact with sister Charlene until she died she was down we used to go down Beatty and and Margaret Ann and I would go down to the convent down by Port Washington and visit with her in the later years and everything mm -hmm. we always kept in contact with her and she had a difficult time in the fifth grade. I can't remember who it was, but some of our dear boys in our class locked her in the closet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, anyway, she was on at Pawnee, so we, we let her out. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, some of these nuns, they had to be saints. <laughs> what they put up with those years, those things don't happen anymore in schools. But, um, and Sister, Sister Car, I think it was Carmela was the first grade one. She was very nice. And Sister Norbertine was the sixth, seventh grade one. She didn't like me. <laughs> she thought I belonged in the hallways. <laughs> and she t she's the one that took me over Father Van Dyke. If you do, I don't know if you have anybody else ever brought up Father Van Dyke. Anyway, Father Van Dyke was a very holy man. He was from the old country, from Holland. And uh, anyway, apparently someone wrote me a note when I was in the sixth grade or seventh grade. And that was the year. It had to be seventh grade because my brother Pat was born. And my mother was in Milwaukee with him. Pat went to Children's Hospital after he was born. And so Aunt Rena was in charge of me. She was a former school teacher. And uh, Sister Norbertine took me over to Father Van Dyke with this note, and I had to write Litany of the Saints with the responses ten times, and then bring it back, and she took me back to Father Van Dyke. I had to bring it to him from a note that I got from a boy. It was Jerry Romanesco, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and so, but the difficult part of this was. Aunt Rena was in charge of me. I had to do this without anybody finding out Aunt Rena or my dad, and I did it. <laughs> I got it all written and put back in. But, um, I mean, that was really a bad thing to do, right? <laughs> Those were, but anyway, that was one of the things that happened. And Pat was born on, in October. You mind. can probably recite the Litany of the Saints to this very the day. Time probably, I get that. Huh? The Litany of Saints is pretty long with the responses. It <laughs> <laughs> takes a long time. October 2nd, 1943. Is when Pat, your brother My brother Pat was born. And Pat uh, had to go to Children's Hospital in Milwaukee, so my mother went down there with him at that time. and. He had surgery down there and he came home before Christmas. And that was a very happy day. And so mother came home and Pat came home. So, so. at this particular time, 1943, um, your dad is on the farm yet? I'm trying to put things in perspective. 1943, no, daddy was in, was he in the store? No, I was getting no, ready to no, go in the he store. Was, he was in the store. I think he was probably working for Joe Geenan. Yeah, that he time. probably was at the working for Joe. Okay. And I'm not sure. I think, though, the gravel trucks were all there. There was always three gravel trucks on that driveway between us and the next house. The church house. I want to see that house was the church house when I was little. So how did it work out now, Pat? You know, uh, you had to run in the house all these years. And now Pat comes along. So how did that all work out? Oh, well, he got very spoiled. He did. Huh? Yeah, he got very spoiled. He had everybody taking care of him. And uh, when I was in, see, someone else came to our house. Rosie Murphy came to our house when she was in the fifth grade. Well, who was her dad? Curly. Oh. Curly was her dad. Her mother died when she was in about the second or third grade. And then her older sister, Rita, was at home. You know, you know which family I'm speaking yes. of. Mm -hmm. uh, Curly's family had Rita and Florence and Ralph and Laverne and Rosie. And then when Rita was old enough, Rita got a job at the Kakana Dairy or what... Um, Kukana Club. Kukana Club. 
So she went into Kakan and she lived there. So then uh, Rosie and Laverne, Laverne was a little bit older, was stayed at home, but Rosie was little. So Rosie came to live with us. And she lived with us from the time she was in the fourth, fifth grade until she married Merle Romanesco. She was with us all those years. And she was like an older sister. And of course, Rosie took very good care of Pat. She was, Rosie's f uh, four years older than I am. So I must have been in the first grade when she came then, yeah. And so she was always there. So Rosie took care of Pat a lot. Because then, that was see, that was just about the same time they bought the store and they started the store. So mother and dad were very busy with that. And then Rosie stayed with us and I got scarlet fever when I was, I was still in grade school. I must have been seventh, eighth grade. I, the next thing I did is I got scarlet fever. And at that time, everybody was quarantined in the house. So my dad stayed over at Art's in where you lived later. Mm -hmm. That was Art Marie's house, mm -hmm. Art Coffee's. And uh, my dad stayed there because he couldn't come to the house till after I was finished being quarantined, like heck. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, that's, and then Rosie was there and she was prom queen with Merle at and all the time that I was quarantined. She, mother made Rosie her prom queen dress. And I have vivid memories of that, of her standing on the kitchen table and my mother pinning the hem around oh, it. <coughs> my mother was a very, very good sewer. She could make anything. She was very good. But she forgot to teach me. <laughs> I'm a very lousy. <laughs> Sewing a button is major surgery for me. <laughs> so, I mean, it sounds like the coffees were very busy people. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so we buy the store from, from Johnny, Johnny Schumer, Schumer, yeah. and did you work at the store early on, or not, were you involved? Or not, no? no, I didn't work at the store. Well, see, then I was gone for the, about the next four years. While, when they first went in, I was away at school. And so I came home on weekends, but I was busy with other things. I must have been taking care of something else. I, don't, I didn't do much at the store. Okay, so... Now, you and Tom get married, and Tom, do you have a job prior to coming to the store? No, no, not, not really. I was going to uh, Fond du Lac Junior College at that time, and then uh, we decided to get married, and Herman said, I need a butcher at the store. So I learned how to cut meat and uh, uh, and I worked at the store, and then so did Jeannie, and Jeannie was the I bookkeeper. And after I we was, were married. Yeah, and I, and I did whatever it took at the store, you know. He, George yeah. Lehman from Hormel Company came and taught Tom how to cut meat. Yeah. He didn't know anything about cutting meat, but he was the butcher then. And, butcher boy. Yeah. And then we first lived up upstairs at the store then for a couple of years up there. Yeah. Well, I remember Tom as the butcher mm -hmm. at the store. And, uh, I mean, you made sausage and all yeah. kinds oh, of yeah. stuff. I sure. mean, I can't imagine, Tom, how you learn how to do this with no formal training. So no, there was no formal training. And I just, uh, the salesman who sold the meat uh, usually knew how to do those things. I, I, think, I think it was Maggie Aunt Maggie. Garvey, Aunt Maggie. Uh, was taught me how to make pork sausage. Aunt Maggie was Phyllis's yeah. grandma. Yeah. 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 Aunt Maggie yeah. was at the store yeah. all the time from the time she Daddy knew. went in the business. Yeah. I was going to ask you that. She was there at the beginning. Huh? She was there at the beginning. Yeah. Aunt Maggie had moved uptown to Freedom and she was very good and Aunt Maggie knew everybody too. So, Aunt Maggie was there all the time. Yeah. Walk down. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the store is open on godly amount of hours. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember Tom as a boy back on the farm. We'd wait for your special flyer to come each mm -hmm. week in the mail. Yeah. Uh, did I think you were in charge of making the flyer? Or? Oh, we yeah we. After we were married, I, I think we all took turns. Yeah. Depending on. Every week that went out, that was the special card. Yeah. Yeah. And did it with the old fashioned 
The thing, mimeograph. Mimeograph, you had yeah. to stand there and do this. And then take them into the post office so they'd go out. Yeah. Now, so you're open like 8 in the morning till 9 at night at the seven. store? Yeah, 7. 7. 7, 7, yeah, 7 o'clock, 7.30 was late. Yeah. And then uh, I think we were open like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. To 9. And Saturdays maybe yet. Died. And of course, Sunday morning you had to be there because church was there, and that's when people came to town. So yeah, Sunday morning noon. was the same thing. Till noon. Uh, but till twelve noon. Yeah, and during the week, and then Tuesday and Thursday closed at six o'clock. Short day, Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> yeah. Huh? yeah, only seven to six. Yeah, yeah. there were, there were a lot of hours. Yeah, the you get there in the morning and. Yeah. And then those special cards. I was thinking about that one day. Yeah. You know how everybody has automatic addresses. Now? I think that we address those every week. By hand. By hand. Yeah. We didn't have anything that would do that. Oh, yeah, we, we, we did, but it didn't work very good. I don't uh, I remember that it was, took all day that day. After a while, we could uh, give so many on Route 1. So many cards on Route One, and, and then so many on put Route the Two, and then they would just deliver to everybody. Route One, Seymour. Route Two, West De Pere. Mm -hmm. That's where all the, the cards went. Yeah. Okay. So we had just so many cards for each, each one of those routes. We didn't have to address them all the time. Yeah. This um, with with uh, that was with the store. One of the interesting things was when I was little and in grade school and that you know, that because it was always was known as Grandpa Murphy's place, even you know after Mother and Dad redid the whole thing. But anyway, it was the central thing for the Murphy family because Grandpa Murphy was there. And oh, you're so, talking about the big white house. I'm talking about the big oh, white house. Okay. I'm going back to the big white mm -hmm. house. How? Anytime there were things going on at the church, this was like the meeting place. We had everyone. The Murphys were all around the area. They all had all these farms. So if it was um, All Saints Day, All Souls Day, when they had those visits at church, it was just like this all day at our house. Everybody ate, played cards, went to church. Ate, played cards, went to church. This went on from early in the morning, and then, of course, about 5 o'clock they'd all go because then they had to go back to do chores. But that was, anything that was going on at church, you were always like the, <laughs> the coming and going all day. Election day. Election day. All, all these was always just like, and I, I guess that's why I, I knew my aunts and uncles really well in the, all, all the Murphys and the coffees, not so much because they scattered right away. But um, it was, it was very interesting how this. It was, it was an absolute given. It was going to happen. I mean, you didn't invite or anything else. It's just a given. And mm -hmm. this, like on Sunday morning when they went to church, you always had to stop and visit, and maybe have a piece of pie or whatever else. <laughs> no. It was, it was just kind of interesting that. You, you grew up especially so that's how I got to know the Murphys and my dad always said like that with the Murphys with the twins Ellen Stella were the twins and they married brothers Smiths they married Ray and what's the other one um, Earl 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 Smith and and Ray Smith and then Curly Murphy married Adeline Smith and he married their sister so there was three from one family, married three from another family, and I said, my goodness. And Daddy said, well, you know, not everybody had a car. If the buggy went, you got what was available. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you shouldn't say that. He said, well, what do you think happened? <laughs> anyway, some of those things were kind of... <laughs> that sounds like something Herman would say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm going to go back to the store a little bit again. Um, okay. 
Tom TV comes out. I remember. Oh, nineteen fifty-three. The Crosley, Crosley franchise. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about the TV. Well, it, it, the funny thing, you know, the uh, you could get a twenty-one inch black and white TV for two hundred and ninety-nine dollars, which, gee, you know, if that were today, it'd be ten times as much. Yeah. Uh, with the value Almost three thousand dollars for a TV. If we're talking today's money, because everything is ten times as expensive as it was then. Yeah, and Except uh, for TVs. yeah, television. He became two hundred ninety-nine dollars. You could get a seventeen-inch for a little bit less, but uh, there, there wasn't that much difference. But uh, we but, sold quite a few. Yeah. But you, but you became the TV repairman. That's where I was going. And there, yeah. that's yeah. that. Yeah, well, I, yeah. He had no background yeah. in that I, either. I didn't know anything about electronics either, but uh, I, I found out real quick that uh, most of it uh, at that time the vacuum tubes just burned out. They they burned out, and I was, uh, to be honest with you, I was a tube chaser. I had all the tubes that they needed, and uh, mm -hmm. a big case. And, and you go around, and <laughs> with, with uh, when the vertical was out, I knew that you had to use a 12 SN7 tube. You pulled out the old and put the new one in. You know, that's four dollars. You know. <laughs> four dollars <laughs> for and, the trip to. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and uh, yeah, if it was somebody close by, well then it, the trip was nothing. But if you know somebody had to go. Drive a little ways and charge them a dollar or something for gas or whatever. That's <laughs> and that that all. It was died. all relative. That yeah. all died. Like but so, you put a lot of antennas on people's oh, houses yeah, too. Yeah, we, we put up you know, in, uh, antennas. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever. From a butcher to a TV repairman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how then, about going out and seeing the far, uh, fathers and uh, the farmers? and uh, get their order for King's Cross Seed yeah. Corn. We did that, too. Uh, the, the store was, if we haven't got it, we'll get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a lot of that. Yeah. Made a, uh, a trip every week into Morley Murphy in Green Bay for the hardware stuff, whatever we needed. And then we had to make a trip into the Shannon Company in Appleton for and the groceries. groceries and, and then all the appliances came from Morley Murphy too. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, the Crosley came out of Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the TVs. Yeah, TVs and refrigerators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and was. Ranges, everything. It was amazing. You became a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. Whatever came in, you sold. <laughs> yeah, how things have changed. I mean, the townspeople uh, all came and purchased their stuff there in those mm -hmm. days, and yeah. you know, uh, was no such a thing as a big box store in those days. Mm -hmm. I guess you could get Montgomery Ward or something like that, but yeah. uh, I think the small town yeah. businesses just flourished in those years. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then of course, then the cars got better, and the roads got better, and. Mm -hmm. It didn't take that long to run into Appleton. Yeah. Like I said, when I was going to high school, all the way from Kokona, I went to that boarding school in De Pere. It was 15 miles. Big Got trip. home once a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, it changed a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, now the store kind of runs its course. In 1965, your dad closes the mm -hmm. store. Yeah. Did you stay on till the end, Tom, or did you go elsewhere? No, and I, I, I did a variety of things. I, uh, I sold Hammond organs. Uh, I went and did that for, uh, that would be about 1960. And I, I was at the store during the day, and then you didn't sell organs during the day. You, got that, you did that at night or evening when, when people were home. And, uh, but I only did that for about a year. Then uh, I, I found another job, uh, and I did it for three and a half years. And I was uh, uh, selling uh, chemicals to the profession. 
I was selling embalming fluid to funeral directors, and I had the state of Wisconsin, Upper Michigan, and two counties deep into Illinois, but I could not go into Chicago oh, okay. because that's where the company was, and uh, I guess House was the best salesman in in uh, okay. in Chicago. Uh -huh. House took because uh, mm -hmm. well, let's face it. Uh, you had to do this by the uh, amount of people dying. And there were more people in the city of Chicago than there were in the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, uh, that's why House got the, the, that business. But I, I burned up two or three cars going around and it would take <laughs> me six weeks to make the complete round, round for the did of three and a half, did three and a half years. Was your familiarity with this part from your growing yeah. up at the funeral parlor right. that your dad that, had? That helped a lot, okay. yeah. yeah. So we I, didn't ask you about, you know, your childhood. Um, why don't you talk just a little bit about growing up at Kukana and, you know, a little bit about your family? Well, um, I, I don't really, um, uh, gee, I went to St. Mary's grade school and uh, when I was in like, uh, Maybe about the third grade, I took piano lessons, and up until the eighth grade. In the seventh grade, I used to take a, a pipe organ lesson one week, and I took a piano lesson the next week. And it was the seventh grade and the eighth grade. Uh, I played the piano, and uh, I went to school. Of course, we had the school there had let's see, eight grades and five hundred students, and I don't know. Every room must have had 40, at least 40 kids, uh, and one nun. Okay. You know, and uh, that's the way the, the school was. Uh, I, I don't uh, remember doing anything other than going to school and playing the piano and learning to play the pipe party. But that's where your love of music came from then? That yeah, pretty music. much so. Yeah, yeah. that's something. Yeah. And then when I had that stint, uh, that one year selling organs is when I discovered that, gee, I could play good enough to entertain. And uh, I, I did that uh, when I was out selling embalming fluid all those, those three and a half years. Uh, on the weekends, I was playing the organ somewhere. I played over in... New London at the Rainbow Supper Club, and that's not there anymore. Uh, one summer, uh, this was even after I wasn't doing a, a, doing the uh, selling a bombing fluid anymore. I went. Uh, I started at the at the mill down down at Tillamany, and uh, I I would uh, do the same thing on you know, weekends. Uh, once I got a day job, uh, I remember a couple of summers I would, I would play on uh, Wednesday night. I'd play in at Channel at the Cotton Patch, and then on a weekend I'd drive all the way up to uh, Manaqua. Yeah, and I'd play in a supper club there on Friday night and Saturday night. I'd stay there, and then on my way home on Sunday night I would play again at the cotton patch of shadow so I would be playing four nights a week and then uh, working at the mill besides so so Gene you you're, your... you're staying at home during this time or are you going with to all home? eight kids okay yeah, <laughs> yeah. wow that was fun yeah that was busy fun. is what it was <laughs> so Tom what year did you go to work at Tomini I didn't uh, I think it was 1967 I think it was 67, 67 or 68, because yeah. I retired in... 93. Yeah, 93. And I had just, I was there just 25 years when I retired. Yeah. He went, he went from, started there and then you went right into the lab down there and yeah. into the research and then you went into the sales. That was a... Yeah. Uh, I, I liked him. It was a great place to work. I learned more there than you can imagine. You know, you look at a piece of paper and you 
say, well, there's a piece of paper. What the heck's a piece of paper? But I, I learned uh, when the paper was thick and when it was thin and when air would go through it and wouldn't. And, and I got in the technical department and, and uh, it, it just got to be a lot of fun. And then one day a guy uh, said to me, he says, uh, uh, do you, uh, you go deer hunting? He said, oh, a guy over in the sales department. I said, well, no, I, I don't go deer hunting. He says, uh, how would you like a job over here in sales? I said, well, he said, everybody's going deer hunting. You come over here. And I, it was really, it, it was really kind of funny that, that I got, that I got from working on the paper machines to in the technical department learning about paper, and then I got back into sales, which was where I wanted to be anyway. But you, you, you can't just go and do what you want. And you you got to learn. Yeah. You got to yes. learn. And you sold so, all over the job. And then the day that the guy said to you, "Was there one person that would?" Could get to buy all this paper. Oh yeah. And what did you say then? Me. And you bought it all. Yeah. And you bought it all. Uh, when I retired, there was nobody to take my place. That told me. And I, what I had done the last two years, I was there. I sold the jellet to uh, somebody else uh, for within. I and I did that for oh, two or three years. And then when they retired, they didn't have nobody to take my place. So. I made a proposition to the, uh, the mill. I said, well, will you sell all the job lot papers to me? Because I knew all these guys that they were buying, and, and uh, that's what I did for three years after I retired. I was doing the same thing that I did the previous three years, and, uh, and it was a really a lot of fun. <laughs> then I retired, retired <laughs> in about 96. What an interesting story. Tom. It was, Okay, so when you hired on at Tillmany, you went into the mill, you started at a basically a... A mill job. A regular... Yeah. I, I was a rewinder, job. rewinder helper. We made small rolls out of big rolls. Okay. That's and what so I did. you worked shifts at this time then? Oh, yeah. Okay. You bet. See, now I don't remember any of that from... So tell us... How many years did you work shifts? Oh, I, I uh, let's see, it was about 68, about, oh, about, about five years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Six years, I was. You didn't work that long shifts. You went into the, the end, what do you the, call that, well, that thing? Technical. 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 You went into department. the technical and then you were a dungeon. Yeah. So anyway, how did whatever. it come that you got the opportunity to go from, like, the rewinders to the technical department? I mean, is this... Oh, because I was inquisitive, I think. Okay. How come I'm not surprised? Yeah. Um, why, yeah well, why, why did they call this a 20-pound piece of paper, and this is 40-pound, and mm -hmm. and uh, the strength of the paper, and so on and so forth. And I, and I just learned everything. And then they coated papers, and we had to uh, take the poly coating off the paper and figure out how much they put on it. And it just went on and on. All these people I read about in the paper these days that can't find a job, they need to take a lesson from Tom Greenwood. I can mm -hmm. see that. Yeah, you but take, you take a job and then you learn. They something. don't do that at the mill anymore. They they don't they won't take you under their arm and teach you anything. No. You gotta you gotta know what you're doing when you get there. I, it's 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 a sad situation, really. We call it progress, eh, Tom? Yeah. yeah. Okay. In September 1956, our son Bill was born, and we had uh, John was born in December, Jim was born in March, Dan was born in April, Jean Ann was born in June, and Bill was born in September. This is five years running, and so John was going to be five in December. And so Tom, he would have always been interested in ham radio. The decision was made that he needed another hobby. <laughs> <laughs> so Tom started ham radio, and in about a month he was a ham radio operator. <laughs> 
So then we always laughed about that, and Uncle Art said to him, the cutest thing, I still have it to this day, of Tom and the Sam radio. And I can't remember what it said on it, but something to that effect. So, anyway, that, um, <laughs> and that, that's why our kids always laugh, because Bill was born in September of 56, and Julie was born in June of 59. Mother, what happened those three years? Dad became a ham radio <laughs> operator. <laughs> well, that was that was that that was really a lot of fun, and it was an interesting thing. I I built a few an antennas, what we call them beams, and uh, I did mostly rag chewing or just visiting with other guys by ham radio. But as the technology kept going on and on and on. It's just three years ago. I just sold all my equipment. I couldn't possibly keep up with the with the technology that they they had. I, I couldn't even understand the uh, the uh, magazines that uh, amateur radio operators uh, mm. used all the time. So I'm out of that now. Completely. Did, did out. you were you on the air? Quite a bit, even till you sold or not? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was yeah I, we, we would meet almost every night at 5 o'clock. Okay. Especially after I retired. Uh, what they called the Badger Emergency Net. And everybody got in the same frequency on 75 meters and, and uh, either exchanged messages or said hello and uh, probably about a half an hour, maybe 30, 40, 50 guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd get together and talk to each other. And you always had that guy from South Africa that came on a certain time every yeah, day. Yeah, every every day at twelve. Mm -hmm. Oh God, it was twelve thirty or something our time. There was oh, a guy yeah. from Johannesburg, South Africa. Huh. <coughs> it would be on. Yeah. yeah, where I was, K9GKV. He was ZS6KG. Huh. So mad. So now I remember when your house was built on Highway S yes. and you guys moved in there. And I can remember growing up somewhat two doors down yeah. of you with the young kids chasing them around the yard and mm -hmm. stuff like this, Gene. Um, so tell us about your family growing up. Our family, yeah. It was a very busy time <laughs> in my life as you heard that Tom was gone a lot. When he was traveling for the sales companies, he would leave a lot of those times on Monday morning and he wouldn't come home until late Thursday. So I had four days there that it was everything happened at our house. You had, you were one busy lady. You got up, my mother would always say, Jeannie hates to get up in the morning because I knew once my feet hit that thing till they were all in bed at night, they were going to be on that floor. <laughs> But anyway, it it was a good time. It was a busy time, but it was a good time. And for kids to have that, that they could go out the door and play, and you didn't have to worry like you did today. They say the kids, they always show it. They always said they always showed up at meal time. But you say, well, did you know where they were? And I said, I didn't know exactly, but I knew that I could find them within probably five minutes. They were whereabouts they would be, and that that's the way it, that's the way it was with the kids, and it was kind of like uh, how history repeats itself. Our son John, when he was John was only five years old, and he had found the thing to go over to school at recess time. Then he could play on the out in the playground with all the other kids. And he'd go into school just like his mother, mother did many years before. So finally the nun said, when, when is he going to be six years old? And I said, in December. She said, I think you better send him over here and we'll test him. She said, let him go to school. <laughs> so I put him in school at that. But it was kind of funny because the kids, they, by that time, you know, it just, that's the way it was. And the older boys, when they come home from school at night. They'd have to take the little ones to the playground and while I did this or that, everybody had their little jobs to do. They didn't always do them correctly, but they did them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it was it was a 
busy time, but it was a happy time. Yeah. It really was. And they all kids would teach their younger brothers and sisters what they knew. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which made it easy. They were they were all teachers. Yeah, they were. They were a busy bunch. They, but you know, they all had rules. Everybody, it, when you have that many kids that close together, you've got to have rules because otherwise it'd be bedlam. You know, mm -hmm. people would say, "Well, how did they know?" They, I said, "They knew when they were going to bed at night." Which ones went to bed at eight o'clock and which ones went to bed at nine o'clock? You never had to tell them; they knew it because that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. And I guess I don't know why they behaved or why they minded, but they did to a certain extent. Except in the years following, I did remember a few times they told me what happened when I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was it, those were good years. But those kids, they had that big yard behind where you were there. We had that field between mothers and uh, and they played out there. I said there was always a baseball game going on. They all the kids in the whole area kind of congregated there because mm -hmm. they had that nice field to play in. They played everything. They played volleyball. Oh, they played baseball. Well, yes. yes, they played everything out there. Mm -hmm. Except we always had a little trouble getting around that corner there where Mrs. Bollock. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She'd go out there. I. Anyway, uh, <laughs> put little sticks in the ground and put a string between so nobody would cross over. Anyway, that was, <laughs> they all grew up with that. Now you mentioned the first five children and mm -hmm. their years. Yeah. Then you had how many more? How many did you have total? Do you want to go right down the line? We had ten children total. We had John. In what year? Nineteen fifty, December of fifty one. My mo mother, you can cut this, but my mother was very happy because we married on the third of February in fifty one, and John was born on December nineteenth. Mm -hmm. We disappointed the whole town of Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> nine months and two weeks. <laughs> no, ten months. Oh, anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, so, and then Jim was born in March, March 7th of 1953. And ja Danny was born in April 5th of 54. Jean Ann was born June 22nd of 55. And Bill was born September 19th of 56. Julie was born June 16th of 59. Joanne was born October 23rd of 60, and Joseph was born January 9th of 62. Let's see from October 60, 62. Mary Pat was born Ju July 17th of 64. I missed that when Julie was born. That was she was a twin. That was in 59, and. Um, so that that's the whole well, crew. No, yeah, well, Mary I, Pat was one day. She was born. She okay. Day she and was sure I lived one day. I was. She, she was born at noon on Friday, and she died Saturday night. Yeah. Hmm. But she was born early, and her lungs at that time there wasn't anything. If you had neonatal like you have today, she was two pounds, and three, two and three quarter pounds. She would have been safe, but her lungs weren't developed. They didn't have anything except an incubator to put them in. Yeah. And that's all they had at that time. Now with this neonatal, they would have no trouble saving a child like yeah. that. But anyway, <clears throat> that's the way that was. So anyway, now we've been into something a little bit painful. Um, going back to your mom. Now, when your dad had the store, I mm -hmm. read that he closed the store in 1965. And uh, your mother passes away in 1967. Was she sick already? Yeah, she had breast cancer. And just like people at that time, my brother was going to Holy Cross out in Massachusetts to college. And um, mother wanted to wait till after Pat went back to school. That, that was the day that she told me she had lumps. She had, had them 
I said, how long do you have them? Oh, a while. But anyway, by the time they got to her breast cancer, it was there and there and in the lymph nodes and everything. And her, she ended up with bone cancer. It went, it was moving. And it, um, it was a very painful, very painful um, procedure with that cancer like that. Bone cancer, when it goes there, it's, and it's like you, she, we had a hospital bed for her and uh, daddy stayed with her. And um, anyway, you couldn't move her. You had to move her with pillows and like that. You couldn't touch her. Well, yeah, but anyway, so that's when daddy, he, sold, uh, he closed the store. And she died in April of 67. So by now, though, your children are... Yeah. John, they all went <coughs> to school. And then when Johnny went, God, they all went to St. Nicholas. And it was very convenient for me for them to run across the street to school and to go to high school, too. John went to St. Norbert. His father went to St. Norbert. So he went there, and he liked it, and he did, he did very well. And then Jim and Dan... When Jim went to the seminary when he was a freshman, and then the next year Dan went to the seminary too, and when uh, Deacon Greg just had his thing over at our church, anyway, I'm, we're Tom and I are in church, and guys behind us were talking about it and something about the seminary, and I so I turned around, I said, "What year were you there?" He said it, and I said, did you know Jim Greenwood? Oh, yeah, we knew Jim Greenwood. He was the one that said he really wasn't going to be a priest, but his mother thought it was a good school for him to go to. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm Jim Greenwood's mother. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. But Jim and Dan went there for the first two years, and, and then they finished at Freedom, and all the rest of our kids went to Freedom. And uh, most of them went on to school. And uh, so John is uh, in Racine. John is, has a computer software company, AMI. It's been very successful, it's extremely successful anyway. And then Jim, he was at, in college when they had that draft call. And his, he was number two, his birth date, when they pulled the birth dates for the thing. And, so I called the draft board and they said, he'll go with the first call. And I said, well, he's in college, what matter? So I called Jim and Jim went down and he enlisted in the Air Force. So Jimmy was in the Air Force for what, 25 years. Jimmy became um, a pilot and he flew the SR-71, he loved it. Oh, and you see him over there. <laughs> uh, anyway, and Dan, Dan went to school he, he moved around a lot. He went to college in Green Bay, he went to college in Madison, and he ended up in college in California. <laughs> and he graduated out there. And then he got a job and he had a choice of Boston or Denver, and he went to Denver and he's still there. He's an IT man with, what, what, what was he with at first when he went? What that was? Oh gosh, he first was First he with, went with Canteen. Yeah. But he, anyway. Yeah, he was with a lot of, he was a computer programmer and, and then... He wrote the book on yeah, IT. There was a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, he wrote a book. And then they, and he, and then uh, he would do outside work. Uh, like IBM would call him up and say, could you do this? And yes, he could, and he would. He was, you would think IBM would have their own, but... Uh, no, he was, was a, what you call, independent contractor yeah, or something and, like that. But anyway, he's fine and he's in Denver. They're all married. John has two children. One of his oldest son is in this company with him. And his daughter, Erin, is a, a surgical nurse. And uh, they're both married. And we have twins from them. Jay, Jason has twin, boy and girl, too. Then Jim has three children, one's in California, one's in North Dakota, and one's in Stratford, Virginia. And our kids, and Jim has, Dan has two children, one's in New Orleans and one's in, in California. And Jean Ann has two children. She, Jean Ann lives here now. 
on Killarney Lane. I think she bought the house because she liked the street. But I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she has two children. Her son, Je Jeremy's a lawyer, and Anna is a teacher. She teaches voice and piano. And then we're as far as Bill, and Bill has a daughter that is an uh, anesthesiologist, and he's got another one that's teaching uh, chemistry and that kind of stuff in high school, and he's a Facebook basketball coach, and Ellen is a businessman, and uh, he's he has a bar, uh, some kind of a, what do you call that? Sports bar or whatever yeah. it is, oh. yeah. Okay, now you can continue. Oh, okay, and she, Jean Ann, she's at... Uh, the prison there uh, in, in Green Bay and also does a lot with the state thing. But she's into the medicine part of medical part of it. Anyway, and that's what Jean Ann, she lives in Freedom now, uh, Killarney Lane. And then we have Bill. Bill is in Wausau. Bill is, um, uh, <laughs> Bill is been quite a few things. Entrepreneur. He's an entrepreneur. He's had uh, started with um, with a, a liquor store and bought a. Uh, uh, this is kind of an interesting thing. When he was going to buy it, he was buying a store downtown, and we went up and we found a, a closed gas station, which these gas companies always do a a thing on how many people go by a place and it day and I said that's what we buy is the gas station and he, did, he bought that to put the liquor store in it because it had its own parking lot and and everything and in the first year he made it three times as big and after about two three years the state wanted to buy it the state wanted the corner which was fortuitous and so they bought it and so then he moved over and he bought a, a it was a what is it a D that thing. Sports bar. When it wasn't. He a, a, it was a sports bar at the time. It was on Highway 29, and uh, it was a, uh, a guy ran it, and he had a little ball field out in the back. It was an American Legion closed um, uh, bar. I mean, it was the bar with it, and, and then it had. He called it. Wiggly Field because the baseball diamond they didn't have any lights, and that's why he called it Wiggly Field. And you all relate to that, and so it, it became Wiggly Field. It had the ball diamond indoor. He made indoor volleyball courts and outdoor volleyball courts, dark leagues and all that kind of stuff, and it was called Wiggly Field. Bill then wanted as a golfer and he wanted to golf and at the Wausau Country Club there was a 10 year waiting list to uh, get in the thing and he said, well I can't wait 10 years to golf. So he went out and he found some land outside of Wausau and bought it and developed it himself, 18 hole golf course and called it Greenwood Hills. There it is. <laughs> and. Uh, Anyway, that was that, and then it came too much. He thought he could just have a manager do the thing. Well, anyway, our daughter Joanne went up there. Joanne worked for the bank in Appleton. So anyway, between her and Pat, they went up there, and they took over Wiggly Field and bought it from Bill and because he was too busy at the golf course to uh, run both of them. So anyway, Bill's got the golf course up there. It's absolutely beautiful. And then, uh, but then the, he also had, during this time, he had become um, a stockbroker and a financial licensed person or whatever. And so then one of the, those people came after him and he said he, he's branch manager of the new Stiffel Nicholas up in Wausau and uh, still had Greenwood Hill. He said, I can't, couldn't pay myself enough <laughs> at the golf course, because golf courses right now are, they're struggling. But anyway, he said, I had, I got a, I got a new job, Mom. So anyway, they came in and built this thing, and Bill has, what, about seven, eight 
Yeah, seven or eight stock, guys. Stockbrokers working for yeah. him, and so he's financial he, advisor, stockbroker. Yeah, yeah, financial advisor and stockbroker. So that's what Bill does. Bill's kind of busy. <laughs> he's always doing something, and uh, so that's why we we laugh at little Evan. Evan never knew what he wanted to do. He'd, do, he'd go to school here and then he'd go to school there. Well, Evan, he's a, he's a businessman now. <laughs> so I said, I think you're taking after your father. <laughs> so anyway, that uh, Bill, Bill is up in Wausau. So now Joanne, our daughter, is up there too. She and Pat, because they, they own and run Wiggly Field now. So if you're ever up in Wausau there by this end, what is the name of it? The little, as you come into Wausau, it used to be 29 right there. Stop at Wiggly Field and you'll know what I'm talking about. That is one busy place. So that, and then we come to Julie. Julie is, um, Julie is in, lives in Kimberley area and uh, she's at St. E's and she's a medical technologist and she was, became, she took her residency at St. Elizabeth's and she's still there, and she's now head of all the labs for the Affinity system, and she is one of the directors of Affinity. And uh, Julie has three kids, and Tonya is Jessica. I'm getting the kids' names mixed up. Jessica is in Madison, and her husband is uh, there in the music. Music. She was in medical school, and then. She decided to get married, and she became a uh, campus ministry. Ministry, yeah. yeah she's mm -hmm. in campus ministry. She got in really into that. And when we went down there the night before her wedding, we were at the rehearsal dinner, and one of the priests was sitting next to me, and uh, he's talking to me about Jessica. <laughs> and uh, with her campus ministry, she said, "She is an angel of the Lord." He said, mm -hmm. he said, you should be so proud of her. And it made us feel very guilty because we felt very badly about her leaving medical school. She had been a straight A student to go to, to go to campus ministry, but they are very active in that. And her husband is at uh, St. Paul's University Church. He's the musical liturgist there. And they have five children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are kind of like grandma. Boing, boing, boing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. But they got five wonderful children. That's Jessica. And then John is, he's a builder. That's John. And he lives in, where does he live? He built a new home out that new area over there by thriving somewhere around in there, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah, just off of French Road. Yeah. And Jenny, Julie's Jenny, is uh, a CPA and a something else for um, over there. And that's her kids. And then we come down to Joe. Joe got married late. He was in his 30s, that the one that was just here. And um, his wife is a nurse, and Joe is with um, Performance something, or in Wrightstown, whatever the name of that one is. Coding Excellence. Coding Excellence. I can never, I always want to say Performance. And uh, so, let me see, Joseph. And, yeah, and he has uh, the boys. Carla had two children when he married her. They were in the first and second grade. And they are Josh and Brian, and Josh is a teacher in Milwaukee, and Brian works for Thri Thriving. And he was a, on the wrestling team, the traveling wrestling thing. He got a full scholarship to, a, what I can try to think of the name of the university in I Minnesota. I can't remember. I can't either. Minneapolis. But anyway, then he taught in South Korea, and he came back, and now he's working at Thriving. And then his other two children, Casey is the one at Stevens Point that we went for the band concert last week, and Justin is still in high school. Wow. And I think that I have a fun through all and of he's them. He's going to be in the band concert tomorrow night. <laughs> yeah. So you had ten children, of which eight are living. Right. And those eight have had how many children? We have 26 grandchildren. And how many great-grandchildren? We have 22 great-grandchildren. <laughs> So you really are a great grandparents. <laughs> We're great great grandparents. Yeah. We've got one. And we got oh. one on the bucket. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So there's quite a crew and they're all we we thank God every day for 
how well they've been. We've had some stumbles along the way, some have had bad things. Our son Bill, his Billy Mike, that was born, was born with a bilateral cleft palate. It was completely the most accurate, one of the worst ones they took him all over to Duke and every place. Mm -hmm. and that. That young man has had more surgeries that you'd ever want to count. Mm. And he does not know that he has any, anything wrong with him. He is a wonderful young man. Mm. And um, I said, I think that kid always thought that you know, everybody had wires in their mouth. They were always doing something with wires and stuff. They actually put his teeth into position in his mouth. His palate was out in front of him when he was born. It was him. It was all open. It was it was something else, and he's had you know he's had to have the ad knowing so everything. The kid has had multiple multiple surgeries, but they at Marshfield moved his teeth into position. I said that poor kid. He always had wires in his mouth, mm -hmm. but he's the one that's teaching now chemistry and that, and he's a basketball coach and up in Gillette. Know, up in Gillette, huh. and uh, I said so. There's been some things, and see, that is a genetic thing. The, and my brother had the cleft lip. Pat had a cleft lip when he was born. But that is just, that's like a pimple. Yeah, <laughs> these days. Right. That. But anyway, so there's been some things that they've had. I said, Bill, when he, they had Bill and Mike, that, that was really, really, really a shocker. And... Uh, I said, they have taken that kid to Dallas, the, out to Duke and Carolinas and everything that, that his, it's all okay. It's, it's going to be okay. Good. Wow. Yeah. That's so anyway, I didn't necessarily have to put that on there, but <laughs> I didn't mean to. I just wanted to tell you about it. <laughs> yeah. So we wind the clock back February 3rd, 1951, and your wildest dreams you never thought. <laughs> Never You're thought. Here today, would you? Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. In fact, it was a funny thing that there were ten Murphys or genies, mothers, brothers and sisters, were there at the wedding that day, and there were ten. No, there were nine coffees. One one of the coffees couldn't make. Doctor Francis from West Virginia couldn't make it. And they were all there at the wedding. And they're all gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Dr. Francis had been here at Christmas time that year, and then he didn't yeah. come back for the wedding. But yeah, he lived in West Virginia. Yeah. You know, we're getting ready to wind this thing up. Yeah. And um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you know, generations are going to watch this. Yeah. Tom, your story about dear tenacity is really overwhelming. I mean, the jobs that he had. And Jeannie, you sitting home with all these kids. I'm going to put you on the spot. These young people today, some friendly advice. What would you give as advice to people today? Go after what you want, and you can do it. Sometimes mm -hmm. it gets pretty tough, but you can, I think so many young people today are afraid to go after things. They're think I can't do it. Sure you can. So anyway, the, uh, the uh, advice that I gave to Jim was just don't lose sight of your goals. And he didn't. He just kept right on going. Mm -hmm. He uh, graduated from college. It was a really funny thing. Uh, he was in the Air Force, but he he had one year at Oshkosh, and then when he first was in the Air Force, he had two years at the University of California. But then uh, the Air Force sent him over to England, and he graduated from the University of Maryland in Frankfurt, Germany. Oh, <laughs> that's, you know, that's... But that's what you had to do. But that's what he had to do in order to, uh, uh, so he could 
be an officer yeah. in, in the Air Force. All that other time he was he was just yeah. an enlisted man, of course, officer, then he course yeah. he went on and did what he wanted to do. He yeah. flew. Wow. And Jim was <coughs> after he retired <coughs> then he uh, then he was and I always said to him, Now Jim, just what do you do? He said, Well, if you have to put something on me now I'm an information specialist for government and industry. <laughs> I said, and what does that mean? He said, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, so, anyway. Jeannie, one thing we didn't talk about at all was, you know, Freedom was a close-knit little town. Mm -hmm. and the neighbors were a very important part of it. everybody else's. Mm -hmm. Life, everybody interacted and helped each other out. You got some examples of um, people helping you out, you helping people out, whatever. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people helped us out, helped oh, me out, and absolutely. helped you out. We had, like I said, had all those kids, but anyway, when I was with the family next door to us, uh, Readers was the name they moved into that house. Marie Reader was a wonderful seamstress and as I said my mother was a wonderful seamstress but she forgot to teach me so I needed help with capital H E L P and every time something happened went awry with my children Marie would fix it for me <laughs> and you don't know how I appreciated her not I mean not just not she always charged me very little but that not not just that, that I had her there. I mean, when you can't do it, someone like that means so much to you. It just, I always told her that in the later years. I said, I don't know if I would have survived, Marie, without you. Now, Marie was Don Reader's wife. Don Reader's yeah. wife, and yeah. Of course, Don was out of town all week long, too, Yeah, wasn't Don he? always traveled so, for Superior Electric. Yeah. He was always a head foreman or something like that. Mm -hmm. But Marie and then her children, her, well, we're all around town here, but uh, she was very helpful. We had interest in across the street from me growing up, there was a cheese factory where our coffee's coffee insurance is. I don't know if you are old enough to remember that. That was a cheese factory across the street. And the Valentine family actually lived in it. But in, way back, Marie, Co Marie Coffee, Marie Garvey Coffee, she, um, it was her, George Garvey's, That's, that was George Garvey's, uh, many years ago, it was not operating as a cheese factory anymore when I, when I was little. There were Valentines lived in the one end of it. But uh, that's where he originally was, that's what Marie, Marie told me that. But she, her mother then, her father died and her mother married Emil Huss. And that's what, why that family is Evelyn Radloff, and those were all that family, Marie. But that was George Garvey's uh, cheese factory across the street there. And so that, it was always kind of a creepy place, we thought, because the people just lived on the one end of it. You know, we always, if we were hide and seek, I wouldn't go and hide in there. It was creepy. Well, wasn't, there, wasn't there another cheese factory, though, down... Uh, down by by John D. Pat's, was it oh, our cheese factory? Oh, that was right across the street. And your mother yeah. wasn't your mother the bookkeeper? My mother was the bookkeeper for that cheese factory for years till it went out of business. It was yeah. right across the street from Maggie and Pat's farm. Oh sure. Yeah, there was the cheese factory there. Joe Conkle lived there later, but um, my mother was always the bookkeeper for the cheese factory. I don't know. She always did that. I don't think Mother ever went to high school. I don't think any of those people did hardly went to high school. Do you remember the name of the cheese factory? Mm -mm, I don't. I'd have to ask Aunt Maggie, but she's not here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you remember some certain characters in Freedom, like, um, no, I just lost it, like Buckskin and no. Oklahoma Jack. Oklahoma and Jack. Why well, do you want know, Oklahoma Jack? Well, he was almost living next door to me oh, yeah? and Hank Garvey's house. That was, Hank Garvey's house had kind of a motel behind it. Yeah. <laughs> and all little shacks that certain people lived in. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you remember that? And Oklahoma Jack was kind of the one. Sometimes he was in there and sometimes he was in the house, but he was always around town for many, many, many years. And you know, he was not a dumb person. He was a very smart man. Yes, he was. If you could get him on the right day to talk to him. <laughs> but he was. He was a smart man. And of course, next door, I grew up with a lot of transients coming and going yes. through, <laughs> through uh, over at the, we always called it the motel. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, that was something else. Do you know that when they took that house down, that was Hank Garvey's house, the blacksmith. The, what do you call the thing in the basement, was still there. The um, still. The still was still oh, in was. the basement of that house when they took that house down. <laughs> it was still there. It's funny that one of those kids or somebody didn't take yeah. that. I, I don't know what they did with it. But anyway, that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. That uh, they were great. <laughs> then we always had... Well, then Nick Leishes were always right there, Nick, the, and, the, and the father was there, too. And they were the ones that had the tavern. They had the hotel in Freedom at one time, too, Nick Leish. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you probably have that from someone else in, in the Historical Society. What's oh, in that book? Yeah, I think it's yeah. in the book. Yeah, about that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Nick Leish. Beatty used to go over and for Vi. <laughs> Beatty always went over and ironed for Vi in the basement. Oh. Okay. Beatty would take me along. I always went along wherever <laughs> Beatty went. And said, uh, we had so many people in our house that I never got tired. And Beatty would let me iron the hankies. <laughs> and I guess nobody ever left me iron at our house. They never left me do anything. I didn't know anything. When I, when I got married, I knew absolutely nothing. <laughs> I always had too many people. Rosie was there. And then... Grandma Coffee lived with my mother and dad for the last years. For after we were married, Grandma Coffee came. Yeah. Obviously, you learned something, or you couldn't have raised eight children. And, yeah. <laughs> Probably. And kept Tom going. <laughs> oh. oh, I knew how you learn by you learn by doing. Yeah. <laughs> doing. <laughs> they learn by doing. They had where we used to have to um, put the bottles on with the. Sterilizer, the sterilizer, and I had, I had done something and had all smoke in my kitchen. And the guy was there, and he was washing the walls to get the smoke off of my kitchen. <laughs> and I wouldn't believe this. And the I must have left the sterilizer on the stove with the bottles in. <laughs> he said, "You better come in here." He says, well, "You got another one going here." <laughs> it was starting to get smoky again. I had almost burned the bottles because I'd have the you'd have to put the nipples and the mm -hmm. things in another pan. I gave it hot. Yeah. Oh, you learn by doing. Yeah. <laughs> and how many years now have you been together? So it'll be February third. It'll be sixty-three years. Oh my gosh! <laughs> we were married sixty-two. Really that long? Yeah, it's that long. Yeah. Johnny's going to be 62 at Christmas. Oh, God. <laughs> we had a couple of good years, too. <laughs> we had a lot of good years. Yeah. We really did. You know, as busy as you were, and as my brother said at our 50th wedding, Pat was always a good speaker. As Tom for Grandpa, he's a good speecher. <laughs> anyway, he said, they never had... A lot, but always had enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that you can do. Yeah. You have to have you just enough, it. and you made it. Um, we're going to ask you a little bit about um, your organ playing career. I know that you played not only for supper clubs and stuff, but played for St. Nicholas Church as well. Oh, yeah, I played for St. Nicholas Church. When I was in high school at uh, at St. Norbert, uh, St. Norbert High School, uh, I played uh, for the high school doings, for the masses, and uh, it, it was all there at the uh, National Shrine of St. Joseph on the, uh, on the campus of St. Norbert. And then uh, after that, I, I didn't play very much until I was uh, 
selling. But I remember the first time that I played the organ in church when I was in the eighth grade because I had to practice from the time I was in the seventh grade uh, for a whole year. And then when I got in the eighth grade, I could play for the 6.30 a.m. mass when there weren't so many people around. And then, uh, and then, like I said, I played through high school. And then it kind of got away until uh, uh, the time that Betty Huss uh, got sick, and and I then I played for the uh, the the big choir uh, uh, for a while, and then off and on. And that was, of course, was at St. Nicholas, and uh, and then we played lots of times. A lot of times I played for the 25th Jubilee for Father Cools, Father Hal Hippus, and for Father Dennis Ryan, and then uh, finally, I think it was Father well, Father Huffman was here. It was when I decided I couldn't play for the the celebration or the adult choir uh, all the time. It got to be too much, too many practices and trying to decide what we're going to do, what they're going to sing. So now I only play for the funeral choirs and uh, my job isn't just playing. I have to call everybody and tell them when it's going to be and where it's going to be and, get the and music. so I have to call, get the music together and so on and so forth. But I do the funeral choirs now and I think I'll keep doing that until somebody has to play for mine. <laughs> Yeah. So that's pretty much all there is to my For the my adult musical. choir became the yeah. celebration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So one thing we didn't cover was your birth dates. Oh. oh, this is fun. The birth date. I'm 3, 29, 32. She is 9, 23, 32. <laughs> We have the same numbers. We have those ones we put on our lottery ticket. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we haven't won. <laughs> you've won, whether you realize it or not. You've won a lot. Yeah, that is. So that uh, Saint Nicholas Choir, you played for about 55, 60 years. You did a good job. There, and this is Michael Randerson who did the interview with Gene and Tom, and thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, I knew Tom and Gene forever. Grew up two doors down from them. And so uh, this is just such a pleasure today to come and, and to be able to do this interview. I had more fun than they did. <laughs>